All right, everybody, today we're going to be talking about opiates. So there's four main points I want to hit. Uh, first thing I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about pain pathways and endogenous opioids. I'm assuming you learned a little bit about or a significant amount about uh, pain and the way that we sense pain in intro to neuro, so I'm not going to do a ton of detail on that. Uh, but we're just going to review those circuits because they are important to know when we talk about how opioids work. Um, then we're going to talk about opiates, which is how we refer to drugs ex like external opioids um, and how they're used. We'll talk about pharmacokinetics and tolerance. Pharmacokinetics are going to be pretty important between different opioids. And then we're talking about addiction and treatment. So uh, there are actually two main path pain pathways uh, that we want to discuss. The first one is the ascending pain pathway. The purpose of the ascending pain pathway is to take information in from the peripheral nervous system through nociceptors, which are receptors used to um, sense noxious stimuli, noci here. Um, they basically, they're going to uh, they're gonna sense severe pain, mechanical disturbances, uh, substances that are released by cuts or physical damage, intense heat, intense cold, anything that can cause pain, uh, acid, all of that can be sensed by nociceptors. It's going to be carried from a um, by a sensory afferent to the spine. Uh, if we're going to the dorsal horn of the spine because this is a sensory input. Um, that's going to go through uh, parts of the brainstem up to the thalamus, right, which is used to gate all sensory input. Um, the thalamus is going to gate that information to the primary somatosensory cortex so you know where the input is going, and then to the limbic cortex so that you can have emotional response to the pain and also use that pain to inform uh, your future decisions. So the information going to the primary somatosensory cortex is so that we can make an immediate escape. For the limbic cortex is so that we can learn not to do it again. You can sort of encode, that was unpleasant, I did not like it, I am motivated to avoid that in the future. Right? So there is short, uh, there is short lasting sharp pain, which is going to do something like do something now to make it stop. And, uh, so that's going to so that's one of the functions of the ascending pathway is to convey that pain, that sharp uh, pain that's like absolutely respond immediately, sort of like removing your hand from a hot stove or pulling your foot back off when you stepped on something sharp. Right. The descending pain pathway is what we refer to as a top down pathway. It's going from higher order processing areas down the spine um, and it is going to interfere how you experience pain. So it is ability, its main ability is to suppress pain once it has served its purpose. When you feel that sharp pain, it has now informed your behavior. You do not need to continue to feel that sharp pain in order to modify your behavior. So a lot of times this information is coming from the primos, primary somatosensory cortex, the hypothalamus, which is going to give you a lot of information about your internal state, um, the amygdala, which is going to give some of that limbic input about the emotional, it's going to go through the periaqueductal gray, which is part of the brainstem, through the raphae nucleus, which is also part of the brainstem. This is where all serotonin neurons come from, down to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So most of what's going on in, in the descending pain pathway is being driven by the periaqueductal gray. As you can see, it's all modulated by these higher order areas of the primary somatosensory cortex, cerebral cortex, hypothalamus, amygdala. But the PAG is in the periaqueductal, meaning the periaqueductal gray, is sort of like the decision-making center here that really gets a say on how effective, uh, how effective this pathway is on intercepting pain information that is coming in through the peripheral nervous system. Okay. Descending pain pathway is not as effective at, um, as remo at removing a dull, long-lasting pain, right? This is present to protect your body part um, to drive sleep and rest so that you can take care of yourself so that you can heal. So this is sort of like when you've sprained your ankle and when you put weight on it again, it sort of gives you, um, it gives you that, it might dully ache most of the time, but when you put weight on it again, you get that sharp pain. So that dull ache tells you, hey, there's still something wrong here. You should be modifying your behavior so that you know that. And the sharp is like, that thing you just did was not good. Do not do it again. So the descending pain pathway is going to have several different kinds of circuits within it. Um, they're all going to involve a sensory afferent, right? The dorsal root ganglion is where all of the cell bodies of sensory afferents neurons are found. It's going to be found in the dorsal root of the spinal cord. Um, they can drive projection neurons, which can then take pain information up. 
the descending inhibitory pathway, that is the pain pathway, right? And it is, it is modulating this ascending pathway. So if this free nerve ending is saying, hey, there's pain here, the, if the inhibitory pathway has a strong enough signal, it can prevent that pain signal from actually, actually causing this projection neuron to fire. So while the pain is still, the stimulus causing pain is still present, uh, its ability to get to the cortex and the higher brain areas is impeded by this inhibitory pathway. There's also a modulatory pathway. So the descending, uh, the descending pain pathway can modulate this projection neuron, right? So instead of uh, directly inhibiting, inhibiting this projection neuron, it can um, mess with a excitatory interneuron. Having an excitatory interneuron gives this circuit more computational power and more of an ability to uh, finely tune or modulate the signal coming in into the projection neuron that will take the information up to the cortex. Another option is by driving opioid neurons. Opioid neurons overall are going to be inhibitory on the postsynaptic neuron. So part of what the descending pain pathway does is drive opioid neurons to release endogenous opioids, which then inhibit the, the ascending pain pathway. This is how opioids have their pain killing effect. They block the, the sensory afferents from actually conveying the, the stimulus to their ascending pathway. Okay. So how, pain, how opioids work is that they inhibit the spinothalamic tract, uh, tract, so that they're acting right here, but like I just showed you, between the nociceptor and the sensory and the dorsal root ganglion, um, and stopping it from moving through, stopping the signal from actually reaching that projection neuron. Additionally, it can drive inhibition from the periaqueductal gray, which can help suppress uh, which can also help suppress any information coming in through that sensory afferent. So the places where the opioids act are marked by these uh, sort of bursts, and opioids can act in all of these places to uh, interfere with pain signals coming in. Okay. There are three different endogenous opioids I'm going to talk about. There's actually four, but the last one, um, NOR, nociceptor, the nociceptive uh, opioid receptor, which is also known as an orphan receptor for a while, is not as important to what we're going to talk about. The main ones we want to talk about are the mu opioid receptor. Um, this is the one you must have, you might have heard the most about. It's referred to as MOR. It binds to endorphins, so that's what you get from a runner's high. That's the endorphins. Um, and when you have an endorphin, it binds to the mu opioid receptor, and you may experience something like euphoria. Um, Kappa opioid receptors inter, uh, interact with dinor. I'm sorry, that should be pretty sure it's enkephalon, and dynorphin is the delta opioid receptor. I believe they all match the kephalon goes with the kappa, so maybe I'll fix that slide and repost this. Um, anyway, the capioid, kappa opioid receptor is what's, uh, what's responsible for dysphoria. So um, it can cause ne negative affect, it can cause stress. So as you can see, activation of kappa opioid receptors and mu opioid receptors are total opposites, right? One's causing euphoria, one's causing dysphoria. Um, the interaction between these two can um, help us balance the emotional effect of pain um, and help provide the right motivational balance between the two. Delta opioid receptors um, help you modulate your mood uh, for the low anxiety and a positive affect, right? So again, this is in, this is in um, opposition to the kappa opioid receptor. So the opioid receptor, it's not like the whole opioid receptor system makes you feel great. There's the ability to make you feel good and modulate your mood positively or cause euphoria. The hedonic tone is basically how much you enjoy something, how, um, how pleasurable it is. Um, but it also has the ability to drive dysphoria and negative affect as well. Um, I'm mentioning this because the mu opioid receptor is going to be what we focus on when we talk about how the opioids work as their mechanism of action. Okay. These three different flavors of receptors are also found in totally different regions of the brain. So this fluorescence shows you the expression pattern of mu opioid receptors, delta opioid receptors, and kappa opioid receptors. So basically the places that are labeled are places where we find them in high, um, in high expression. So as you can see, mu opioid receptors are really highly expressed in the thalamus. This totally makes sense for that gating of sensory signals that we talked about earlier with pain. Um, it also is going to be found in the striatum, right? The striatum is going to include the nucleus accumbens, so it makes sense that we would find those there. Um, uh, so these mu, delta, and kappa opioid receptor 
expression pathways sort of represent um, and reflect the fact that these, two, these three different populations of receptors have very different functions. So, so the interesting thing about the interactions here is that um, the, it's thought that the mu opioid receptor uh, is thought to drive the recreational drug use. This is what makes you feel euphoric. So you binge and you become intoxicated. Okay? Um, the withdrawal and aversive state um, that might be drawn, that might be caused by an overactivation of kappa opioid receptors and di. Um, Delta opioid receptors, especially in the absence of mu opioid receptors, maybe possibly they're usually balanced, but if they've been overstimulated by an exogenous opioid, uh, when they when the opioid is removed, there's nothing driving these mu opioid receptors, and the kappa ones will become overexcited, and that's when you're going to see dysphoria, lower mood, higher anxiety, increased increased stress reactivity. All of these are going to be withdrawal effects that we see with opioids. It's going to be very aversive, um, and that's going to sort of drive the preoccupation or anticipation of another binge and intoxication. So the balance between these three different populations of receptors is thought to help drive the opioid recept the opioid addiction in that way that we've talked about, where there's both the positive effect and the negative effect. They're both driving drug use. How the preoccup how they all play into the preoccupation and anticipation of a high um, is still unclear. It could be an involvement of all three, um, but we're not exactly clear yet. Okay. So this is a lot of information, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but I thought it might be helpful to just sort of show you that, um, no, it was right. Kappas are dynorphins and deltas are enkephalins. I got it right before. Um, I should trust myself more. This is that nociceptin orphanin that I talked about before that we're not going to really concern ourselves with. So the mu opioid receptors are, um, in, are binding to endorphins. They are found in these brain regions, and they are associated with these functions. So when you have an opioid drug that does all of these um, functions, antitussive means that it stops you from coughing, um, that you know that it's mostly interacting with mu. Right. Um, if you have something that is interacting with kappa, that's not going to have the same effect. It actually, kappa uh, activation of kappa opioid receptors is thought to possibly be able to help modulate addiction problems. So this is more of a um, helpful summary reference slide, but um, uh, you don't need to memorize all this information. Of course, um, it's just sort of a reference. OK, so. Here's where those two come in, um, in driving addiction. So you have those beta endorphins. Uh, beta endorphins are going to inhibit GABA neurons. Those GABA neurons usually are going to inhibit our dopamine neurons, which are found in the VTA that project to the nucleus accumbens. We refer to those as part of the mesolimbic pathway. That should be familiar. When you drive the opioid receptors, remember when we're driving opioid receptors, we're not driving this neuron necessarily, we're driving wherever the opioid receptors are expressed, which includes on the axon terminals of these GABA neurons. That is going to inhibit the release of GABA. That is going to disinhibit these dopamine neurons. This is a very similar mechanism to what we saw with alcohol, right? If you have dynorphin, right, that can inhibit the dopamine release to the nucleus accumbens. That's where we can get some of that uh, remember, dynorphin is, bind is binding to those kappa opioid receptors. That's where you can get some of the dysphoric effects, right? Hopefully that will make some sense. Um, if you remove this dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, you will experience that as not pleasurable. We'll most likely refer back to the circuit when we talk about opioid addiction intolerance, but um, it's, good help it's a helpful way to think about how uh, endorphins and dynorphins can balance in motivation. Okay, so... Opioid receptors can um, can inhibit in multiple different ways. The first one is postsynaptic inhibition by opening potassium channels. Anytime you open a potassium channel, usually the potassium is going to leave. It's going to cause a hyperpolarization. Um, this is all happening through G proteins. All opioid receptors are metabotropic. Additionally, you can have axo-axonic inhibition. That is referring to the fact that this axon terminal is synapsing onto this axon terminal, right? It is not a axon terminal to dendrite synapse, it's axo-axonic. So what they're doing is it's one another way to modulate neurotransmitter release. So 
when you when the opioid is released here and binds, this inhibitory G protein, a GIO, is going to close the calcium channels and decrease the release of neurotransmitter. This is a similar mechanism to what we saw with cannabinoids, except for it's not um, it's not uh, ooh, what's what is the word I'm look it's not retrograde transmission, it's axoaxonal inhibition. Okay, uh, you also have presynaptic autoreceptors. Um, the autoreceptors can sort of modulate their own release, right? This is, remember, anytime we talk about an autoreceptor, we're talking about the levels of a neurotransmitter modulating its own release, right? It's not here we're modulating the release of other neurotransmitters, here we're modulating the release of opioids specifically. Okay, so those are the pain pathways and the sort of uses of endogenous opioids we use. It'll serve as a basis for what we build a lot of these other topics on. Next, we're going to talk about the different opiates, um, the exogenous opiates, um, and how they're being used.